Good morning, everyone. Is everyone awake? Oh, good morning. <laughs> Excellent. So to get the energy up this morning, I think we should all just give a big round of applause for the best conference in the world. <laughs> Excellent. All right, so we're going to talk about async and await and getting back to the basics. Do you all love JavaScript? <laughs> I'm kidding. We're going to talk about C Sharp. Someone left. Hey, I'm joking. All right. So we're going to talk about being efficient with async and await. And the word efficiency can mean a few different things depending on who you talk to. For me, when I talk about being efficient with async and await, it's about being able to efficiently add code in my applications and make the code readable as well as maintainable for the future. And I also want to make sure that my applications are understandable by, by my users and that I don't have applications that randomly crash because I have threading issues and so forth. So in this case here, efficiency means that we want to make sure that we apply the async and await keywords in a manner that makes sure that our applications work properly and that it's easy for us to work with them in the future. So why do we want to bother adding async and await and the asynchronous principles in our applications? Well, mostly it ends up being because newer APIs that are out there, we grab packages when you get or we use more disk or we use database calls and so forth in our applications, these new APIs are all asynchronous, which means that we will need to learn how to use these principles properly. And one really big reason is because often this happens. We get an unreliable application and we really want to avoid that. Now this is an Android application and I'm not saying that each Android application is unreliable, although by default the OS itself is kind of unreliable. Although in this case here, this is a Samurai application it's using C Sharp, and everything that I'm going to talk about here today is kind of applicable in Xamarin or WPF or WingForms or ASP.NET or console applications, any type of .NET application. Where it differs between the different applications, I'll mention that, for instance, in ASP.NET, there are a few things that are a little bit different. But mostly the things that I'm going to talk about is the same across all the different types of .NET applications. So we want to increase these asynchronous principles to avoid these unreliable types of applications, as well as improving the user experience. So how do we avoid locking up the UI? Well, we leverage all the available resources on our devices. So this is my super fast computer, and it has a lot of cores, a lot of memory, a lot of disk. And if I use the asynchronous APIs properly, I can leverage all of these different resources. But using this CPU is not only about asynchronous principles, when we talk about CPU-bound operations, we talk about parallel programming. So when we talk about these asynchronous principles, a lot of this is very similar to when we talk about parallel programming. These two paradigms are very similar. There's a very thin line between what parallel programming is and what asynchronous programming is. The fundamental difference is that when we apply asynchronous principles or asynchronous programming, when we start off a concurrent operation, the idea is that we want to know when this thing is done. So for instance, I go ahead and fetch some data from the web. I want to do that somewhere else. I want to relieve my UI of work so the user can do other things in their applications. And when the data has been loaded from the web, I want to be notified and subscribed to that event and be able to process that data accordingly. When we talk about parallel programming, we have a chunk of data and we want to process that by chucking that up into smaller pieces and working with them in, uh, concurrently. And we can apply these different principles together as well. So here's an example of a mobile application. I click a button in the mobile app, it goes ahead and fetches some data. When the data's downloaded, it can go ahead and process that in parallel. Right, so just to look at a little bit of code, we're not gonna go ahead of ourselves. But this thing here starts off an asynchronous operation. It then inside this asynchronous operation does some parallel computing. So you might ask yourself, why would you do this? Because the, the parallel extensions are using Parallel 4, for instance, that locks up the current thread that you're calling it on. And this thing here now offloads this work to another thread in my application. And don't worry, we're going to go through a little bit of this throughout the talk. So in order for us to achieve this, we need to go from a synchronous approach to an asynchronous approach. And the way that we do that is by also going from a blocking application, like we saw on the Android application that's currently crashing, or when we're doing too much work on the UI thread or the main thread in the application, we're gonna be notified that the OS thinks that this application has crashed. So we want to avoid blocking things and go to a non-blocking application and non-blocking code. And the way that we do that is by avoiding the heavy work on the UI thread. Kinda of makes a lot of sense. But we don't really wanna think about the threads and managing the thread 
thread pools ourselves. So we have helpers to allow us to work with this more easily. One thing that I'll mention here as well is that when we work with asynchronous principles, one of the things that we should never do is block our asynchronous operations. So if we, for instance, use an asynchronous API, loading something from disk or talking to a web call using the HTTP client, we should never be calling the dot result property or the dot wait method. Because what happens then is that it's going to block the asynchronous call, and in some cases that's going to end up deadlocking our application. You might think that it makes your applications, application synchronous, but what it's really doing is that it's making your application unreliable. So in reality, what's gonna happen here is that we're gonna take this Android application, we're gonna change this, and apply some asynchronous principles, and all that we're now left with is a little bit of a better user experience. Now, if I show this to the UX designers at my work, they're probably gonna slap me in my face and say that this is no better user experience, because I'm still blocking the application. But I argue that if I'm faced with the, the left picture here, I would most likely terminate the application and tell the OS to, well, just terminate the app because I don't think it's gonna respond. I think it's crashed. While when I see the, the loading indicator, I will be more inclined to wait for that to finish. So how do we apply this in .NET? Well, we use something called the task parallel library, which is a way for us to simplify working with both concurrent as well as asynchronous code. So even here, the line between parallel as well as the asynchronous principles or a very thin line. So they group both of, both of these different paradigms together in the same bucket. So we can work with the concurrent principles as well as the asynchronous code, and they're pretty much the same thing. The only difference is that when I do an asynchronous operation, I can now subscribe to whenever that's done. So a task allows us to represent one of those things. So we can represent work that we want to do somewhere else. So in this case here, I'm, I'm simply saying that I want to run this thing somewhere else. Don't block my current context, don't block my current thread, just go ahead and run this somewhere else. Manage the thread for me, I don't care if you're reusing a thread in the thread pool, but just do this work somewhere else. Now, what I can do with this task here is that I can do a whole lot of different things. I can subscribe to whenever this is done, I can take care of a potential result if this returns a value. We have the task here, for instance, for a task of string, it's a generic class. It will allow us to return a value out of this as well. So I can use this to do a whole lot of things, and most of the asynchronous APIs in .NET is now leveraging this. There are other asynchronous ways and principles and, and patterns that we can use as well, but we're not gonna cover this here. So let's just quickly have a look at what this looks like in Visual Studio. I have an application, I'm now using WPF, because it makes it easier to run the application. It's a little bit faster than booting the Android emulator. So this is a simple just WPF application. I have a, a couple of buttons or one button. I have a text block that allows me to just enter some data in the UI. Pretty simple. And again, this would be the same in ASP.NET or in console applications. All these principles are pretty much the same everywhere. So now what I'm doing here, I'm clicking my button, and then what's happening here is that we now have this task that run here, which is now offloading some work of a method somewhere else. So you'll see here that I'm not using the anonymous method that you saw in my slide. I can also just pass the, the method name of whatever method I want to run somewhere else. I don't have to care about scheduling this on the thread pool and managing this thread myself. So what's happening here is that this is going to run somewhere else. It's going to, going to run on a different context than the UI thread, which means that invoking the UI thread, if you've ever, ever done UI programming, can I see a show of hands how many of you have done UI programming? So almost everyone in here has done anything with UI programming. You know that if you're spawning off a thread and you're trying to communicate back to the UI thread, you're gonna have a problem because you can't do cross-threading when you're talking back to the UI. So everything in do something here is going to have to somehow communicate back to the UI thread, but you won't just be able to, to call it straight away. So this here will in fact crash, or it will, will give us an exception, right? So we're trying to, in here, update our text box inside the application so this here should crash the application. But if we run the application, something interesting is going to happen here. So when I click the button now, you would probably expect this to, to crash. I click run here, and in fact, nothing happens. It did possibly run this method here because I can, I can set a rate point in here, and we can rerun the application. And hopefully now, we can see here that we were inside do, th do something, we respond off to a different thread, but nothing happened. Didn't update the UI, we didn't get an exception. The reason for this is if we release the, the, um, the debugger here now, it's gonna tell us that we do have an exception, but it didn't crash the application. 
What's happening here is that it's capturing this exception on the task. It is now, now setting that on the task itself. So since we have this task that run here, all the work for do something is happening inside this other task. So whenever there's an exception on this asynchronous operation, it's going to capture that and set this on the state of our task itself. So now you might ask yourself, well, how do we check that? Well, on the task itself, we have a lot of different properties. We can check if we have a fault state. We can grab the different exceptions that occurred on this particular asynchronous operation. We can check if it's completed or canceled and so forth. But if I were to check here if it's faulted right at this point here, the operation might not even be done. So the way that we make sure that we can check if the task faulted or if it's completed and handled a potential result is by introducing something called a continuation. Now the continuation allows us to kind of subscribe to whenever a asynchronous operation is done. So I'm using this method here called continue with, which will be executed when our task is completed. Again, I'm passing the method that I want to run here. I could use an anonymous method as well if I want to do that. And what you'll see here in the method signature is that it's automatically going to pass the task that completed. And do something returns a string, which means that this thing here will be returning a task of string because it'll then return this string to whoever is subscribing to the completion. So now in here, we get the completed task passed to our handle task method. We can here check if it's, if it's faulted or not. So if I set a breakpoint here, we'll run this here. We'll see that we're gonna get an exception. We are now inside the continuation and we can see that we have this, this uh, faulted state on our task. So let me zoom in here, a little bit too much. And you can see here that we have a state is faulted, and if we check the exception here, we can see that we have the exception telling us that you cannot do cross-threading communication. Now what's even more interesting is that we know that we got in here and that it's now trying to update our UI again. The problem here is that the continuation using the task parallel library also executes on a different context, which means that I'm not back at the UI thread when I'm in the continuation here. This means that I'm trying to update the UI but nothing happens, so what happens with this exception? The thing is that when you're inside a continuation, that is also wrapped in a new task. So what we have to do if we want to capture that is to say, well, I want to continue with, with this thing and check if the, the task that I got here failed as well. And if that task fails, this kind of gets ugly, right? Yeah, so we don't want to do that. This all leads up to the awesomeness of async and await. But then you can see here that I'm using something I told you to not, never use, right? So I told you to never use the result property on your tasks. That's actually false. You can use the result property as long as you properly awaited your task, right? So inside here, we're, in, we're inside the continuation. What happens here is that I can now grab the result out of my task that just completed. So this here will give me the, the string representation of whatever was returned. So this here is going to tell us from Philip in the, the completed task result here. But how do we make this work, just to, to show you that the demo works? In order for us to update the UI, we need to cross-communicate with a different thread. This works a little bit different depending on the type of application you're building, but in WPF, we can use something called a dispatcher. Well, I can evoke something on the UI. So I can update the text here. Now let's just do... I've been doing Kotlin for a while where you don't need semicolons. That's nice. Um, and then we'll do the same thing in our, in our uh, continuation. And now this here should hopefully work. If we run this, it's gonna say hello from NDC and then from Philip. But this kind of defeats the purpose of having asynchronous code here, right? Because now what's happening here is the only thing that we're really doing inside our asynchronous operation that we're offloading to somewhere else is communicating back to the UI thread. So you really have to be careful about these different scenarios and where you want to come back to the original context. And again, this code starts to look a little bit ugly. I really don't like when you have to, to use the dispatcher. I'd much rather have a more you know, linear way of reading my code and this here becomes a little bit unmaintainable. And just to give you a little bit of a hint of what happens now, if I were to say give me the result out of this here, this, this would now deadlock the application. But we'll get into that a little bit later. All right, so that kind of shows you how to use the tasks in, in the TPL, just the fundamentals of how we work with these, with these different um, things.
Now let's talk about the async and await keywords and how they are going to improve the ways that we work with this asynchronous code in our applications because it's going to be very different from using the TPL like in this raw way that we just saw here. So the async and await keywords are simply contextual keywords. That means that when they announced the async and await keywords being added to the language, they didn't want to do any runtime updates. I do reckon that if they were to add the async and await keywords now, like if we just imagine that we didn't have the async and await keywords, they would probably release that with .NET Core 4 or whatever, and, or .NET 5, which is gonna be the next thing, and they would probably update the runtime to support coroutines and do it properly. So what they've done here with the contextual keywords is that they've done a lot of compiler magic to make this work. So everything compiles down to the, the code that we have available prior to the using the async and await keywords. They're just building a lot of things for us when we are applying these things. So when you add the async and await keywords, what's really happening is that it's generating a lot of code and a lot of complexity. So the async and await keywords, the idea here is that we want to hide the complexity that we just saw here. So we don't want to have this chain of continuations and doing continue with. We want to make sure that if we get an exception, that's going to be traveled back to whoever calls the asynchronous method or whoever's awaiting that. We want to increase the readability because in this case here, if we had a problem in our continuation, we would have to put on a, a new continuation and, and continue doing that and that quickly becomes very ugly. Although the problem with async and await is that it becomes more error prone. So if we're applying these keywords in the applications, our applications will most definitely at one point deadlock or crash or you'll have a problem. But let's try and see if we can figure out why that would be. So in this case here, we have a very simple, simple method here that pretty much does nothing at all. But I've applied the async keyword and you can see here that it's not returning anything, right? So it's not returning a task by itself. But when we apply this async keyword, what's magically going to happen is that this here is going to generate some code that will return a task for us, right? That is so we can track the ongoing operation and the ongoing works that are happening in here. Another thing to, to point out here is that we have the await keyword and if you ever see this being used alone, you're doing it wrong. You always want to use the async and await keywords together. And you only want to use the await keyword whenever there's something after it. If the last thing you're doing in your method is the await keyword and you don't have any awaits before that, you can simply return, you can simply return the task instead of awaiting it. Let's look at an example of that later on. So the await keyword is now what we're going to use in order for us to mark a continuation. So that means that we can replace our continue with call with the await keyword. As long as we mark the method as async, we can now do this instead. What the await keyword will then do is that it'll validate the success or failure of a task, which means that it'll check for any exceptions. It will check that it's a successful or completed state. It will make sure that we come back to that particular context whenever it's completed, right? But what's interesting is that whenever it sees the await keyword, it's going to return back to whoever's calling our method. That means that it's not gonna process any of the code in the continuation, which is after the, the await keyword until after it's completed. So what's the big difference between await and task continue with? If we just look at them like this here, it doesn't look like they're much different. But the thing is with the continuation on the continue with method, we're on a different context, we're running on a different thread. So it'll be very hard for us to invoke the UI, for instance, or talk back to the main thread, or use things from the original context, right? If you're thread static things, that'll be a little bit problematic as well. So when we're inside the continuation with the await keyword, we're back at the original context. And that'll make a lot more sense when we, we're gonna look at a little bit about on the code that's generated from this as well. And when we do, it'll make a lot more sense why this is being executed back on the original context and why it's returning a task and so forth. But just keep in mind that the idea here is that we're going to be back at, for instance, a UI thread in this case here. So let's uh, jump back into Visual Studio and see how we can apply this in our application. So I have some, some code here. I'm gonna comment out the, the first portion of what I showed here. And we have pretty much the same thing, but it's now using the async and await keywords. So we still have this method called do something, do something, which is up here. It's a little bit different now. We're actually doing some work. So it's, it's doing this task.dli2000, which is simply a way for us to represent that we're doing an operation that takes a little bit of time. Instead of me having to rely on the internet connection in Australia to go and fetch something from the web, 
I'd much rather fake the two seconds happening here. Otherwise, we'll be waiting all day. All right, so now we've marked this as async, and we got the await keyword. These are always used together, right? And then we're doing something in the continuation. So as long as do something here is being called from the UI thread, what's gonna happen here is that the, the last line, which is debug.txt is plus is equal to hello NDC, is going to be executed on that same context. So if I have a look at how this is being executed, we have this run click event handler. The first thing that we're doing is that we're updating our text to starting, then we're calling the method do something. This is all called on, on the same thread, right? We're getting to the, the top thing here. It runs this line here and sees that, well, there's a wait keyword here. So what's gonna happen now is that it's going to return from the method. It'll return up here to the next line. It's gonna say running. And then we have the await keyword again. And what's gonna happen then? It's gonna return back to whoever's calling the click event handler. All right, so then it'll return back. And then when it's done, it's going to run the continuations, right? So this here says that, well, if this task is not completed, don't proceed executing the things down here, which is inside the continuation of this method, right? Only execute this as long as our task here executed properly and without any exceptions. So now what's gonna happen here is that after about two seconds, we're gonna be back inside our context here to execute the continuation. And which is the first continuation? Well, it's the thing that we have here, right? So this is the first continuation. This is our first await keyword. So this means that the first thing that's gonna happen then is that it's going to execute hello NDC. Then it's going to find out that, well, now that task is done, so we can go ahead and run the continuation of this task. It's gonna be down here and so forth. Let's just run the application and have a look. So it should say starting, running, hello NDC, and then whatever comes next here. And what's interesting here as well is that you can see here, I know this doesn't build, that's great. Because the app is running. Starting running, hello NDC, hopefully, yeah, there we go. And then it's going to go ahead and run whatever's after here. So now what's interesting here is that out of do something, we grab the task, so we can start this operation, we can run some more code, and then we can say, well, I want to await that and run all the code after this here, whenever that task is done. So then it proceeds to call the same, pretty much the same handle task function that we had earlier. It can check if the task is faulted or not, so if it had an exception, which we didn't, so it didn't do anything. Then it goes ahead and runs something else that's asynchronous, so you can see that we can have multiple await keywords in the same method, no problem. The thing here is that this one here isn't executed until you know, we're back in the continuation of the first one. So do something more here, also sleeps for two seconds, right? So that, that's going to be executed after, after the first continuation is done. Does that make sense? So how do we now know that the task failed or proceeded properly? Well, I mentioned that if we throw an exception in here, we, we can't get an exception out of cross-threading now, right? Because we're now back at the UI thread here at the bottom, so that just works. But if I throw an exception after two seconds, so I can spell throw, throw, hello. Does anyone wanna come up here and help me write some code? There we go. So now if I run this here, this should probably crash after two seconds. And now the application crashes. So that's pretty good. The exception that we got earlier, or the exception that we get now, is now traveling back to whoever's calling this method. So how do we make sure that the application doesn't crash? Well, first of all, we don't throw any exceptions. But after that, we make sure that we wrap things in a try and catch block. So now I can go ahead and, and try and catch this. And now, if we put a breakpoint here and run this, we'll see that we caught the exception of the task. So what happened here is that not only does it travel back to whoever's calling the method, the calling context, it also makes sure that the task completed properly and we can catch those exceptions as well. So that's all great. This allows us to write a little bit more readable code. I would urge you though to, to not have so much code in your, your handlers or whatever. But you wanna make sure that you always have the async and await keywords together. And I never ever want to see async void used in your applications, and we'll get into that in just a moment and see how, how really terrible that is. But pretty much, if you use that in a car, you'll die. All right? 
Perfect. So this here now illustrates that we can do the asynchronous operations that we saw earlier. We can await the task and we can make sure that we're back at the original context. But what's also interesting here is that what if this thing here were to spawn off a different task? So let's say that this, let's get rid of the exception first. Let's say that this task itself returns something or it returns a, a task that runs something. You could have a task that spawns another task. How do, we, how do we make that work? Well, we could, for instance, say that we have a task of a task. And we could, um, actually, let's do it in the other method instead. Um, we could say down here instead. So instead of returning the string here, we can say that we return a task of a task of a string, whatever you want to do that, but you might want to. And what I can do here is that I can now say, I want to, to create a task. In this case here, I have a static string that I want to return, but the signature of my method tells me that I have to use a task of task of string. So now I can represent a completed task with a particular result. I could also say that we have a task of from exception, or from, probably don't have those here, but you can create tasks from exceptions, and um, I think that depends on the .NET version. But now what happens here is, um, how do we make sure that this, how do we await that? The thing here, this here, do something more, is now going to return a task of task, right? So we can simply apply an await keyword in front of the await keyword. And now the code is so much more readable. <laughs> and so much more understandable. Still gonna do the same thing, hopefully. Hopefully it's still gonna work. There we go, still works. So no matter if, if we, imagine doing this with the, the TPL, we'd have to have a continuation and then the continuation inside of that and it would just look very nasty. But now this thing here takes care of, first it's checking, really what's happening here is that if we do this a little more, more readable, what's gonna happen here is that the first thing that we get, we get the task which is running a task itself, right? It's grabbing that task. It's validating that that task executed properly. And then when that task returns its task, it's then validating that there's no exceptions. So that's pretty helpful. All right, everything's clear so far. It's totally understandable. You will never have any deadlocks, I promise. So let's talk about the state machine. This is the thing that's returned or the, the thing that's generated whenever we apply the async keyword. So the state machine is pretty much this thing, like a nagging kid in the back of your car that's asking if you're there yet. It's just continually asking if, you, if the asynchronous operation is done. If it's not done, it'll proceed doing other things. If it's done, it's going to execute the, the continuation. Now my daughter's only two years old. She's telling me that we're there. She's not asking, she's just telling me to stop the car. So now, what else does the state machine do? Well, it handles the result and the potential errors. That means that if there's a result on our asynchronous operations, it'll make sure that that travels back to wherever we want to set that. It also makes sure that if there's an exception, it's going to put that on whatever thing that's awaiting it, right? So if we have an exception on a task that's have a continuation on the UI thread, it'll throw the exception back on the UI thread and you can, you can pretty much just handle that properly, right? So it's also in charge of executing the code after the await keyword. So that's great. So what does the async keyword really do? Well, it's generating its state machine. And when it's doing this, it's moving the entire method body into a different thing. Sounds good, right? So pre-compilation, our method looks fairly simple. We have a, some variable initializations, we do an asynchronous operation, and then we're running something to debug dot write line. When this is compiled, the code looks nothing like what we had earlier. There's no debug.write line here, there's no variable initialization. Everything's moved into this generated state machine here. But now you can see here why the method signature, it just removed the async keyword, and the, the reason that it doesn't keep the async keyword when it's compiled is because the IL, the, the language that the, the runtime executes, doesn't have any, any async keywords or anything like that. So what's, what it's doing here, it's using just some compiler magic to generate code that's doing all of this for us. It generates the state machine and runs all of these different things. And it's returning a task with a representation of the ongoing work. So we can keep track of, of the works that are happening, if there's any results, if there's any exceptions, and so forth. And then if we peek inside the state machine, now the implementation isn't really that important, but it's interesting to see that inside the state machine we have our task of delay here, it's getting the awaiter, the thing that, it, that keeps track of if that particular task is done, 
and then it can check if that is completed or not. If it's not completed, it's going to return to whoever calls this thing inside the state machine, and the state machine then executes these things again and check if it's done and so forth. Then at the bottom here, we're back and, and running everything in the continuation. So now, this kind of makes sense, right? If you go back and have a look at this post-compiled code here, you can see that everything here is executed on the same thread, right? Everything here, every line here is executed on the, on the UI thread, for instance. There's nothing here going off, running some, something somewhere else. That means that the code that we have in here, if you look at the last line here, that is executed on the UI thread as well. So that's executed in the same context. All right, just keep that in mind for now, and we'll talk a little bit about async void. This is a picture of me whenever I see async void in the applications. Is it really that bad? Well, obviously, otherwise I wouldn't talk about it. So async void in this case here, it doesn't look like it's that bad. What's happening here is that we have the same method signature. All that I did was remove the task here and replace that with void. So what's the big issue here? Well, first of all, if we look at the generated code here, there's nothing returned from the method, which kind of makes sense because it's marked as void. Although a task that doesn't represent or doesn't tell you that it's returning a value, it's a task that's, by definition, not returning anything, and that's a ta void task, whatever you want to call it. But in this case here, we're actually using void itself, so we have no way of tracking the ongoing operation. We have no way of knowing if there was an exception. So that's what I, why I said earlier that it, whenever you see a car running C sharp and using async void, I would change car. I would use this one. So how do we fix this? Well, it's pretty simple, right? We just swap it out with task. See that? Very, very, very subtle. Oh, there we go. Crash again. So, all right. So if we just replace this with a task here, we cannot change the the signature of our of our method in our application, right? This here now changes the contract of whoever is calling this method, which means that if there was a potential error here before, I've worked with developers that like to get exceptions thrown back to the UI and crash the application rather than gracefully just capturing all of them. Personally, I don't like that as a user, so please never do that. Just in this case here, if we get an exception here, this would tear down the application. In this case here, we wouldn't know if there was an exception or not if we don't await this thing here. So how about we just have a look at an, an async void demo? It's always fun to look at crashing applications. So I have this thing here. It's a simple method. It's doing an await task to delay, doing some asynchronous operation. And then I'm just throwing an, app, throwing an exception. This here is marked as async void. You should never do that. But where would it put this exception? So if I simply call this method, I'm going to call it up here, uh, run async. I can't apply the await keyword here, right? Because I don't have a task. This doesn't return anything. So this will now tell me, well, this is async void, or this is not returning a task, so you can't await this. That's a little bit problematic. So now if I run the application, not only can I not say that all of these things down here, I can't move them into a continuation of run async. They will have to be executed sequentially, right? So if I click run here, after about two seconds, I think the application is going to crash, and it looks like it did. It crashed, right? So that's not good. So how do we solve this? Again, obviously, don't throw any exceptions, but if we have to, how about we just wrap this in a try and catch block? Can I see a show of hands? How many of you think this is going to work? Well, it's kind of a leading question, right? So it's the same thing here. I run the application. After about two seconds, the application is going to crash. Even though I'm wrapping this thing here in a try and catch block, What's happening here is run async is being executed on the UI thread. It's not being executed in line here. So it knows nothing about the try and catch block. So this thing here wouldn't be able to capture that exception. So what really happens here is that whenever this exception in run async occurs, it's going to set that back to whoever's calling the method or the calling context or the app domain or whatever you want to call it. This means that it's going to tear down the application because this here is being executed on the UI thread and so forth. So that's not really good. So the way that we solve this, of course, is by changing this to a task instead. But then we have to properly await this in order for us to capture the exception. And now what happened is that the code down here won't be executed until two seconds after. So we have a change in behavior of the application, which we might not have wanted to. And so keep that in mind. So we, don't, we want to avoid async void, but if we simply replace it with async task instead, 
we might have different implications in the application. All right, so let's talk about a little bit more fun things. Let's talk about deadlocking. How many of you have experienced a deadlock? Excellent. That's perfect. So almost all of you have had a deadlock. And those of you that didn't raise your hand, I know you've had a deadlock. You just don't know yet. So really, a deadlock is we've, uh, we've seen that um, problems can occur. And when we get a deadlock in the applications, it pretty much means that there's no point of return. We can't return from a deadlock. So a pretty hard to read example of that is, is this here. So let's say that we are running some asynchronous operation. This here just delays for one millisecond, which isn't really that long. Inside the continuation of this method, or inside the continuation here, I want to invoke the UI like we saw earlier. I want to update the UI whenever I'm done inside the continuation, like we do with the await keyword. So why shouldn't I be able to do that here? But then when I say here, I, I really want this to, to block my application. I don't want this to, to go ahead and be asynchronous. I want my users to suffer. So what happens if we do this here? This here is now going to say that I want to block this thread from executing anything else until this asynchronous operation is done. However, what's happening here is that we have an asynchronous operation that needs to talk to the UI thread. And the UI thread is being blocked. Hence, we have a deadlock, right? Looks like a complex scenario. Looks like something none of us would do in our applications, right? Although what's interesting here is that there's an easier way to get a deadlock, and that's just simply to call wait on an asynchronous method, right? And I see this happening quite often, not particularly using the wait, key or the wait method, but using the result property, for instance. Especially if you're writing unit tests or you might not have asynchronous, the async and await keyword available inside your test runner and so forth, you might be calling the dot result and that just deadlocks the test. So that's not good. So let's avoid doing that, all right? And then another thing I see quite often is the, the unnecessary use of a lot of different state machines. So I, I mentioned earlier that if you're not doing anything, anything inside your continuations, there's no point in having the await keyword. So an example of that is we have this run async method and you know naming things is hard so that's why my next, next method is run internal async and so forth, right? So I have all of these different methods and one of the common things here is that I have the async and await keywords because one of the misconceptions with using async and await and using the task parallel library is that whenever you have, have a task, you need to await that because someone once said that you should use async and await all the way down. And that means applying the async and await keyword everywhere where you see a task. But that's not really what that means. It means that we shouldn't be blocking our asynchronous operations. We shouldn't use the result property. We shouldn't use the wait, keyword, the, the wait method. But we shouldn't do this either, because this is really inefficient. And if we want to be efficient with async and await and write readable and maintainable code, this is not really what we want to. Because what's going to happen here is that we're going to generate a state machine here, a generate a state machine here here and here as well. And then we don't do anything in the continuation here, so there's no point in having those async and await keywords. So if there's nothing in the continuation, there's no need for an await keyword. So the way that we kind of solve this is by simply replacing the await keyword with a return and then removing the async keyword and we have the same method signature. But less code that's being generated. All right, so let's have a look in Visual Studio what that looks like. So I have a console application, and since uh, C Sharp 7.2 or 3, you can now have asynchronous main methods, which is really nice. I don't know if anyone really writes console apps, though, outside of demos. But. So this run async method here, all of these different methods that we just saw here, they're all have appending the async and await keywords, even though they might not need to. If there's nothing here below this keyword, there's no need for the await keyword. Although, the, the case of, of this being like this here, we do have something in the, in the continuation, right? So in this case here, we have two asynchronous operations being scheduled and we are awaiting both of them. But if all that you want to do is wait for both of these to finish and you don't care about them being executed at the same time, do you know what we can do instead? We can do task.whenAll. We can do task delay like this here. We get rid of this thing here. Do that. Easy. Start off the both the asynchronous operations at once. We have a task that represents when both of these are done. 
And now we don't have the async and await keyword anymore. So if I just go back here, and we'll have a look at what the code here looks like when it's being generated. I'm gonna compile this here. I'm gonna head over to Reflector, which is an application that will allow me to have a look at the code that's being generated. So you'll, you'll see here that we have a lot of things inside our, inside our class here. In particular, we have these different asynchronous state machines that's now being generated. So we have one for run async, one for run internal, one for something async, something internal async, and so forth. And for this, like for this demo here, there's not a lot of code inside the state machine. But for simply returning an asynchronous operation, which, they, which is two task delays, this is a lot of code, right? And if we have more complex code or complex methods, this here could look a lot worse. So of course, the simple way of, of solving this is to just replace the, replace the, await, the await with return, get rid of the task, and if we do the same thing here, you see the, the signature of the method and whoever's calling the method is doing the same thing. Doesn't change the behavior of the app, doesn't really change how you use the, the methods. And now we got a little bit less code generated. So that's a nice improvement to our application. So that's the unnecessary state machines. Let's also have a look at deadlocking. All right. So for deadlocking, I mentioned that it's really easy for us to deadlock if we're calling wait or result on one of our asynchronous operations. And here I have a little bit more of a, a real world scenario. I'm trying to read a file from disk. And then what I'm doing here is I'm reading the file asynchronously from start to end, and then I'm going to set the result on my UI to, uh, to that. So now what's interesting, there are two things that's interesting here, this new C Sharp 8 feature which is enhanced using, so we can we no longer have to wrap the entire thing in a using block. And I have a talk on C Sharp 8 tomorrow if you want to come to that. Now what's happening here is that all of this code here is being executed on our UI thread, right? So from top to bottom, it's all being executed on the UI thread. The continuation needs to communicate back to the UI thread, which means that when we block the UI thread like this here, the state machine can no longer execute. And that's problematic, right? So there's a way for us to solve this. Now imagine that I really want to block this, this call here. What I can do is that I can, I can wrap this in a new task and say I want to run the state machine somewhere else. And I want this to, I want to wait for that. What's happening here now is I'm blocking the UI thread. I'm taking my task and I'm running that, I'm taking the state machine and running that on a separate thread. Do you think this code is bug free now? It's not. Promise. So what's happening here is that we're getting an exception, right? Because we, we're now trying to update our UI from a different ta task, right? Previously, our run async method tried to invoke the UI because we expect it to be on the UI thread in this continuation. All right, so as good developers do, we're gonna in, in, introduce a dispatcher. Does anyone think this is gonna work? This isn't gonna work either because what's, we, we now have a deadlock again. Because now I'm trying to update the UI in the continuation, but I'm blocking the UI until this entire thing is done, all right? So we're trying to refactor the application and make it better, but we're just making it worse. Still have a deadlock. So this kind of illustrates that it's super easy for us to introduce deadlocks in our applications. So of course, the, the proper way to solve this is to change this here to a return a string. We're gonna return this thing here instead. The last thing here is the um, await keyword, right? So we can probably remove that. And now we could probably do this. But remember I said never use a result property, so we would have to introduce the async and await keyword to make this work a little bit more nicely. One thing, one thing to keep in mind, I, I mentioned earlier that we can remove the async and await keyword if there's nothing in the continuation. This thing here is a continuation as well. So whenever we are assigning a variable or whenever we are, in this case, invoking the UI after the await keyword, that's also something that happens in the continuation. So now the application is going to behave a little bit better. 
although we had to do a little bit of refactoring to make this work properly, and the contract of the method now changed, and our, it was a lot of work just to make this work, right? But then again, we don't have a deadlock anymore. So one more thing I want to talk about is cancellations. This is one thing that I see being misused quite often. So we're going to look at an example that, again, looks a little bit tedious. But in this case here, I have this long running operation. It's a wild through loop. I want to offload that to somewhere else. I want to run this long running operation somewhere else. Even though this might be more CPU bound, I can use the TPL because the TPL is always also used for concurrent work, right? So what we're doing here is we're simply trying to update the UI every, every 500 milliseconds. I have this task, a delay here at the bottom just to illustrate some, some work happening with that data. Now, I'm gonna run this here in a separate task because this is on, it's both on asynchronous method because we have the, the async and await keywords, right? But it's a while true loop and this thing here is going to be executed on the UI thread if we run this off our click event handler. So we don't want that. So we're gonna wrap that in a new task to offload the work of this entire while true loop to somewhere else. But we're also gonna pass something called a cancellation token. Now, when I do this, this will allow me to then cancel this cancellation token. We have a cancellation token source here, which allows us to signal all the tokens or all the places that's using the token that you should now cancel. So we pass this cancellation token in here, and then we can call cancellation token.cancel. Now, I see this very often. Um, although when you call cancellation token source of cancel, nothing's gonna happen. So if you were working with Kotlin, for instance, if you, if you just cancel your coroutines, it'll just terminate the entire thread, which is, in my opinion, a, a, a weird thing to do. Because if we do something in here and there's a cancellation scheduled, we might want to roll back the, the newest change or the newest thing that you did, right? So just terminating the thread could be that we're terminating whenever we're trying to set debug.txt, which means that we might end up in a really weird scenario in the application. So how do we make sure that we can listen for whenever the task is canceled? We can introduce this thing here. Since we have the cancellation token, we can now say, if there's a cancellation requested, just throw an exception. And whoever is listening to this asynchronous operation, if they're properly awaiting this, they will get an exception telling them that this was canceled. All right? It's really super simple, and we can do this in, in different variations as well. So if we have a look at pretty much the same code here, but if we neglect to have the cancellation to token um, telling us that it's uh, cancellation has been requested, if we just run this application, it's pretty much the same application that we had earlier, and click run here, and when I click cancel here, nothing's gonna happen, right? And if I introduce this thing here, all that I'm doing inside my cancel click event handler is calling cancel. The cancellation token source is being updated to a new one every time I click my run, run method. Otherwise, what's gonna happen is that you're all, always gonna start this off with a canceled cancellation token. And if you call task.run with a canceled cancellation token, it won't start. So that's kinda bad. So let's run the application again. I'm gonna click run here, and then I'm gonna click cancel. And you can see that there was a slight delay there that I, I'm gonna click cancel, and then it still entered one last element. So depending on when you add the cancellation, when you add the listening for the cancellation token, you could have moved this up to, to the top, up here, or to the bottom. It kinda depends on how you want to handle that. You can also listen for it and subscribe to whenever a cancellation has been requested. So that's one way of doing it, but I also have a, a WPF core application. So with .NET Core 3.0, we can now use WPF, which means that we can now leverage the new C Sharp 8 features, which means that I can now use my asynchronous streams in this application. So we'll go through this demo as well. It's a little bit more of a real world scenario. So this run click event handler here, it's going to set my text to nothing at all. It's gonna create a new cancellation token source. It's gonna run my run async method. The run async method now has this, this new syntax for a for each loop. Whereas say for each element, which is going to come to me asynchronously, I want to await that. So we have the await keyword in front of the for each loop because each element that I get out of this lyrics thing here is going to be streamed to the application. Makes a lot of sense, right? Hopefully it will when we look at the implementation here. So this here is a new thing as well, the I async enumerable. You can use the, normally you use async task or an async task like object. 
But in this case here, we have an I async enumerable of string, which means that we are going to return one line at a time. We're going to read a line from disk. We're going to do some work with that. And then we're going to return that back to the caller. So for each line that we get, it's going to be streamed back to whoever's calling this. So that's pretty cool. And now I want to be able to cancel this as well. So I have the cancellation token in here. So after I read the line from disk, I can't pass a cancellation token to read line async because it doesn't support the cancellation. So I have to do the cancellation in my while loop here. All right. And again, I have a cancel button. So when I click that, hopefully it's going to cancel the application. So Rick rolled. I can click cancel and the operation was canceled. Super simple. Another scenario where you might want to use this is something that I call smart cancellations. So I'm gonna run the application first and then we'll talk through the code that I have here. So imagine being able to search for something. So whenever I work with mobile applications, I try to apply this pattern. So I, for instance, I wanna search for, I've been doing public transport, so you wanna search for the closest stop or you wanna search for a bus that's gonna leave in 10 minutes. When the user enters the data, you don't want to ping the API for every keystroke. You wanna figure out how long does it take for a user to type a word, and then when they stop typing, you wanna search for that particular thing that they're searching for. So we kinda of measured 400 milliseconds or 500 milliseconds, so whenever I type something in here, you can see that I'm going to abort the call to my thing, and then after a little while, it's going to, to go ahead and query my, my API or whatever. So whenever I write something here, it's going to cancel that, so for every keystroke, and then when I stop typing, it's going to search. And the way that we solve this is by simply listening for whenever the text changes. Whenever the text changes, I'm going to cancel the ongoing operation. So you might ask yourself, what is the current ongoing operation? Well, I have a task at delay here for 500 milliseconds. I'm gonna pass the cancellation token in here. So if I simulate 500 milliseconds worth of work and I don't cancel that, I know that in the continuation of these 500 milliseconds, I can now go ahead and load my data off the web or from wherever I want to load that. You might also want to pass the cancellation token in here and have that properly propagated down to your HTTP client or whatever. But this means that I can now capture whenever there's an exception because when I await this here, it's going to throw an exception whenever this has been aborted, all right? So that means that we are going to be in the exception handler down here and we can now handle that properly. All right, so Let's look at one final thing. I haven't talked much about ASP.NET, but one of the things I do wanna mention, everything that we've talked about, except the how do we invoke the UI, of course, is different in ASP.NET. Although one of the misconceptions, maybe not anymore, but in the early days of the async and await keywords was that when you apply the async and await keyword like I'm doing here, for instance, on my index action, is that you would automatically, automatically get AJAX on your client, but that's not really the case. So what you get here is that the server side part is asynchronous, which means that if we are running some work here that takes a long time, we're loading something from disk or the database, the web server can now go ahead and take care of other requests while it's going on. That means that if we have the await keyword here, it's gonna release the thread back to the thread pool so that IIS can take care of other requests in ASP.NET. Other than that, we can use the async and await keywords just like we do in WPF or console applications. We can even get the deadlocks like we do in other types of applications as well. So if I do the same thing here, we have this thread on the thread pool running our application. If I run this and call slash home slash deadlock, if I can spell home, this will in fact deadlock the application. So if we run, but now if I run this thing here, it's gonna say okay. So it still listens for, for other requests, right? But we have a thread here that's now deadlocked. How it's going to handle that afterwards, I'm, I'm a little bit unsure if it's go, ever going to terminate that thread or not, but just avoid deadlocking your applications and you will probably be fine. Other than that, we can use pretty much the same uh, principles in ASP.NET. In earlier versions of, of not core versions of ASP.NET, so you have ASP.NET, the, the normal MVC and web API, 
you use something called the configure awaiter or configure await in order for you to be able to configure how you want the continuation to, to, uh, to work. So for instance, here I could say configure await and say false. This means that whenever you are done, it's not going to try and marshal back to the original context, which means that when we're down here, it's a completely different thread or a different context than what we had up here. Does that make sense? All the way in ASP.NET Core, that works a little bit different, so I don't want to talk too much about that because it's just going to be confusing. But basically, you can just remove this in ASP.NET Core, but if you're working with libraries, you might all, always want to do this. Because what happens is that all the code here above the or below the continuation is now not going to try and get back to the original context. So if you're working with libraries, for instance, that don't care about the original context or the original thread, you don't have to try and marshal back to that. One more thing about that is it only affects this method in here. So if we have someone listening for, for this method somewhere else, let me show you what I mean about that. So if we have, if I do this, configure wait in, in my run async method, that's not going to affect this method up here. Right? It only affects this one and the, the things after its continuation. But again, that's totally confusing and if you run into problems with ASP.NET and asynchronous programming, hit me, up, hit me up on Twitter and I'll try to, to help you out with that. All right, so if you want to learn a little bit more, I've recently redone my async course on Pluralsight, so you can go ahead and, and check that out. It goes through all of these things in much more detail. I talk about parallel extensions and a little bit more about how you can use these two paradigms together. And if you do check it out, let me know if you, if you like it or not. All right, so to wrap this up, we've talked about everything from the beginning of how you use the task parallel library to how you apply the async and await keywords and do that in an efficient manner. Because efficiency can mean that we are efficient in writing the code and being efficient in maintaining the code, but also reducing the amounts of generated code and the potential problems in our applications. So I think that if we try to apply a lot of these things in our applications, we will, try, we will probably avoid some deadlocks and some problems in the future. So I hope you enjoy this talk and that you got something out of it. If you have any questions, you can ping me on Twitter. I'm Philip Eckberg, and it's been my pleasure being back here in Sydney. Thank you so much.